that you guys are here this morning. Give God a hand. Don't give it to me. Give it to him. We've been in an exciting series. Brad and I have loved, and it's called Ready for Anything. I hope you guys are enjoying this as we're teaching through the end times, looking at the signs of the time, looking at the rapture. Today, we're going to move into part five. But before we do, we want to just look at our series text, which is Matthew chapter 24, Verse 44, you can memorize this before this series ends. It says this, you must be ready. Say ready. ready. You must be ready for the Son of Man will come when least expected. It's our goal to prepare you to be ready for anything, no matter what turn of events you are here for, that you are prepared and ready. But before we dive into that, we're going to pause and we're going to pray for our nation this morning. So as you know, today is November 8th, 2020. And uh, how many of you guys never want to hear that year again? 2020. <laughs> I'm ready for 2021. New Year's Eve party. I know. And uh, at the time of this recording, that's today's date. And as you all know, it's still unclear uh, as to the final outcome um, for the 2020 presidential election. While mainstream uh, media outlets are reporting a win for uh, former Vice President Biden, the Trump administration is still pursuing judicial processes and hopes to unveil uh, suspected voter fraud in key states. The election isn't final, which means two things. Regardless of what side of the fence you sit on, that's not my point. Here's my point. The election is not final. My point is, number one, we need to continue to pray for a safe and fair election. Um, as you know, we uh, conducted an eight-day fasting and prayer challenge last week up until the day of the election. And then you know what happened. And so we've continued to fast and pray every day. I, I hope that some of you have felt prompted to do the same. Um, but I would encourage you, until there is a final decision, we want God's will. And so I would, I would encourage you to continue just one meal a day. Just carve out 15 minutes, push away from, the, from, from that meal, and spend that time in prayer and sincerely pray that God uh, that God would truly have his will to be done. And that's the second thing. Um, a lot of times in life, uh, we, things don't work out the way that maybe we want to, okay? We want them to. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to remember that, that Jesus was, had his head bowed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was saying, God, you know, please, if there's any way that this cup can pass for me, let it be done. But not my will be done, but your will be done and so we have to learn as God's servants, as God's people, we have to continually pray that God's will would be done in this nation. Even if you don't like the results, if you don't like how it turns out, we have to know that whatever leaders are in place, this is hard to swallow, but this is God breathed. This is his word. God has supernaturally placed those leaders in charge. I want to read real quick uh, Romans 13. I think it's 13 and 1. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. It says, uh, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, granted by his permission and sanction, and those which exist have been put in place by God. You can look through all of history. You can look at King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. You can look at Hitler. You can, you can go all the way through time, and you can see how we have had leaders in places that you would think, why on earth would God allow that to happen? But behind the scenes, God is fulfilling his purpose and his plan, and he's sovereign, and we don't always understand what he does, but we have to trust at the end of the day that God is in control. And in the end, we've been telling you through this whole series, God, we know how this thing ends. And he's going to be glorified, and the church is going to rise up, and we're going to meet Jesus. And, and so I want to encourage you to be encouraged, regardless of how you wanted this, this campaign uh, to turn out, I want you to be encouraged that God is in control. So continue to pray. We're going to pray right now and agree as a church family. Those watching online, let's just pray right now. Father, we love you. We trust you. We trust you, God. We don't understand all the mysteries that are about to be unveiled in these end times, but you do, and we trust you. And so, God, we give this uh, campaign to you. We give this election to you. And we just pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that you would be glorified. We pray, God, that if there's, if there's anything that has been done in the dark, that it would come to the light. We're praying, Father God, that this would truly be a safe and fair election 
And uh, God, that you would just be glorified in it all. We pray ultimately, God, that you would just orchestrate your perfect will and your plan and come back soon. We are anticipating your arrival. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, today we are in part five of our city. City. <gasps> You're praying for our nation. Okay. Of our series, part five. And today's title is this. You're going to love this. If you're still here, if you're still here, today we are talking about a part of the end times that can be a bit scary, can be a bit overwhelming. We're talking about the tribulation, all right? It's a seven-year period that we're going to kind of dive into, and I'll tell you this. There is so much to this that I can't possibly, like I've literally been sick for days trying to decide what to squeeze into a 30-minute message, right? And all of kids ministries praying we don't make it an hour long because they are all serving, right? Trying to squeeze it in because there's so much here. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that if you're still here, you know what not to do, all right? You know what's going on. But I pray to God that everybody who is under the sound of our voice and hears our ministry is ready and you're not going to be here because we talked for three weeks about the rapture. Why? Because it was so important to us that you understand that we fully believe the church is going to be raptured out of here prior to the tribulation if you are ready, all right? Say ready. So today we're going to be answering two questions in this message. Two questions. Here we go. What will happen the moment after the rapture of the church? We're going to paint a picture for you that maybe you haven't thought about. What's going to happen the moment the church is raptured out of here? Millions of believers are gone. The second question we're going to answer in this message is what you need to know about the tribulation if you miss the rapture. All right? What are you going to need to know if you miss the rapture about the tribulation? Let's look today at our timeline. I'm going to quickly look at this timeline this morning as we've been going through this over the last four weeks. So currently, we are in the age of grace, or the church age. And if you're just joining us for the first time today, this is basically the time where anyone can come to Christ. God's gift of salvation is a free gift. It is your choice. You can freely come to Jesus. You can surrender your life and live for him. And I would encourage you to do that. I think after today's message, you'll want to do that. All right. The second, the second part that we're looking at is the severe age of grace. And the severe age of grace is the seven-year tribulation period. We're going to dive into that today. During that severe age of grace, the reason it's called that is because you can come to Christ. There will, be, there will be an opportunity, but it will be at a great cost, all right? In that cost, it will be being beheaded, okay? If you are living during that time and you give your life to Christ. Then we see that the second coming happens. Jesus comes back, as Brad has told you over and over and over. This is not the sweet Jesus that came in the manger. This is not the sweet Jesus we're going to celebrate his birthday in December. This is the warrior Jesus that is coming to bring his wrath upon the enemy, all right? We're going to dive into this today. Then we've got the millennial reign of Christ. That is literally a thousand-year reign where the believers are going to come back. We're going to reign on earth with Jesus. We have the final judgment followed by the eternal age. At that point, at the eternal age, everything is set, okay? Everything is set. It's kind of like um, making a flight. How many of you guys have ever flown standby before? You're, oh, okay. See, me personally, I don't like that at all because there's no guarantee. You're just going to show up and hope that somebody doesn't show up and you can get a seat on that plane. Mm -hmm. See, you don't want to mess around with this, with being standby, okay? You want to make your reservation in advance. You want to know that you got a ticket, you got a seat number, and you know that you are going in the rapture, right? You don't want to be going on standby. I want that to stick in your head. All right, Brad is going to dive into that first question right now. All right, so uh, that question is what will happen the moment after the rapture of the church, all right? So uh, I want to begin with this. There are moments in your lifetime, there's been these big events that have happened, global events, that you will never forget. You will remember exactly where you were the moment that it happened. If you were, let's say, born in the in the not born, but if you were living in the 40s that long ago, you may remember Pearl Harbor, okay? If you were alive in the 60s, right, you may remember the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You might remember exactly where you were. You would remember the news uh, programming that came across the radio to hear all the details of that event. 
in the 90s, maybe the Oklahoma City bombing. How many of you guys remember that? Okay, and then we move into 2001, 9-11. I remember I was locked in. I, I was in our college dorm room, and Misty came in the door. She said, you skipped class. What are you doing? And I'm on the couch, and I'm just completely in amazement as they're showing these. I'm locked into the TV just watching these reruns of the horrific images of these planes uh, tragically crashing into buildings uh, into the, the Twin Towers and just watching it over and over and just watching as uh, little pieces of information is unveiled. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. And, um, you know, all these events have something in common. They were complete surprises to society. Nobody really knew. I mean, nobody as far as the mass population knew that this global catastrophe was going to happen. But there, there's coming an event that, like these events, will be a complete shock and a surprise to all of society. But it will not be a surprise to the saints of God. It won't be a surprise at all. In fact, we've been anticipating, we've been expecting this event for now thousands of years. And that event is the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And when this happens, I just want to help paint a picture for you as this happens We're going to hear this trumpet blast. And we talked about the word cosmos was used in the Greek to explain this moment. It's literally a millisecond when all this transpires. There's going to be a loud shout as of the voice of an archangel with the trumpet blast of God, which is saying the king has entered the room. The king of kings has entered the room. Give all hail and praise to the name of Jesus. In that moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Scripture says... Those who are dead in Christ will rise up out of their graves and be caught up with Jesus, be raptured, be re he's going to receive those who are dead, wedding language. He's going to receive them as a groom receives his bride and is ready. And those who are alive and remain, those of us who have called upon Jesus, not those who have religion, but those who have relationship, will be raptured, will be caught up, will be snatched away, and we're going to meet with him in the heavens. Now, immediately after, see, all these last four weeks, we've been talking up until this point. But what's going to happen once we're gone? I want you to ima just imagine, and you may, your creativity may think of things I haven't even thought of, but just imagine Christian pilots, planes just falling out of the air, cars just, just crashing, just, just mass chaos as millions and millions and millions of people mysteriously simultaneously disappear. Imagine hearing the news. Imagine maybe you're driving and, and, and you're, now I'm, I'm talking from the standpoint of one that is still here. And I think this is an interesting twist to, to today's message because up until this point, we've been helping you to be ready for his return. But this message is to help those of you who have rejected the word of God through this series to help you to be ready like you said, when he raptures us out of here. So, you, so the news comes across, maybe the radio. We're going to lose power. All sorts of horrible things are, are going to happen. But if you're able to hear it, if you're able to see it on social media, you're going to hear these news channels broadcasting that simultaneously these millions and millions of people have just mysteriously disappeared from the face of the earth. Think about it. Teachers in the classroom. The class will be sitting there and the teacher is just gone. Students will just disappear mysteriously. Um, surgeons doing surgery will be in the middle of surgery. Say scalpel, nurse turns, and the doctor is gone. He is, the doctor is out, <laughs> right? Married couples lying in bed. Can you imagine a couple that one is serving Christ, one is not? One, they're lying in bed, and one turns the other to kiss them goodnight, and their spouse is gone. Think about this. Think about this one. A mother holding her baby. And all of a sudden, as she's holding her baby in her arms, her baby disappears out of her arms because she's not ready. Can you imagine the, 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 the screaming, the chaos, the fear, the, the, the mystery, the uncertainty? Can you imagine the condition that the world will be in in this moment, especially those mamas missing their, where did my baby go? Imagine, imagine 
I break in for just a second while you're right there on that point? Come on. We didn't have time to cover this in our messages on the rapture, and I don't have time to really teach it, but we do believe, um, and, and we could teach on it later, but that children will go in the rapture. There's a day of accountability, um, and in the Jewish culture, that day was age 12. Okay, that was the day that they went from being a child to being an adult. If you do some study, many theologians believe that that is the day up to age 12. And so um, and, and for a the, lot of Christian the, parents... The reason they believe that is because everything that God has done in end time on the end time calendar, he is lined up with the Hebrew culture and the Hebrew calendar. So if we look at that in the same light, then there is actually an age of accountability. And you've heard of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs with girls and boys. 12 and 13 are those ages. So just to bring a little bit of clarity, because I've actually had some people who were wondering, you know, like if we haven't had children yet, should we even consider having kids and bringing them into this crazy yes. world that yes. we're living in with what is to happen? And as we said last week, absolutely. Live your life. Plan like Jesus isn't coming for 100 years, but live like he's coming today, all right? And so we truly believe as parents, it is our responsibility from the time that they are breathing, that you are pouring Jesus into their life, that you are making sure that they are ready because we might be wrong. We might be wrong. So you don't want to bank on that. And I can tell you this, if your kid hasn't decided to serve Jesus by the age of 12, it's a slim chance in those teenage years, all right? There's only, I'm doing this because I know the percentage. There's a 6% chance if you haven't come to Christ prior to your teenage years, there's a 6% chance that you'll come to Jesus during those teenage years because those are informative years. They're very difficult. So as parents, if you've got littles, you need to make sure you're pouring the word of God into them every single day. I kind of have heard people say, like, I don't want to shove it down their throat. I'm the exact opposite. Hey. I am the exact that's, opposite. That's foolish. That is absolutely That is your, your biblical responsibility is to raise your children That's up right. to fear God. Look, read Deuteronomy 6 this afternoon, parents. God gave you the responsibility to pour the word of God over right. your children day and night. When you get up, when you lie down That's to right. bed, when you walk, when you do what you do, you are to pour right. the word of God. That's your God-given right. responsibility as parents. It's right. not children's church. Come on. It's not right. Willie and Courtney. It's not Momentum right. Kids. It is your responsibility yeah. to disciple your, your children to live for God. Yep. That's right. So that just... Pray for them. Throw that in there. Okay. So... Widespread panic across the globe. It's going to be the worst chaos you could ever possibly imagine. Think about the, the workforce of just the Christian, the Christian population. Who knows how many millions of Christians there are on the planet today, but imagine that workforce disappears. Now you have a complete economic crash. There will be a global financial pandemic immediately, immediately, not to say just not, 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 even just to mention the, the physical chaos of all the crashes and the chaos that's happening, but there will be a financial crash as well. And so you're going to see this massive tidal wave of chaos across the globe, and people are going to be scurrying around. Churches, I believe, will be filled with people crying out in the, in the, worst, in the worst cry for help that our ears have ever heard because they will realize that they were not ready. They're still here. And so um, in, that, in that moment, you know, there's going to have to be leadership. When there's chaos, there has to be leadership to pull everybody together. And so I believe, this is my theory, but you know, the UN is that agency that, is, that really kind of tries to keep all of the nations playing well together. And I believe in that moment, the UN will, um, will have a leader that will rise to the surface, which we believe is the Antichrist which is Satan's Messiah, um, we believe, possessed by Satan himself, a man, um, possessed by Satan himself, which will pull the world together and try to bring some order to it all financially. Uh, the stock market's going to crash. Everything's going to crash. So this person is going to bring the world together and promise peace financially, promise peace around the globe, and he'll start orchestrating everything to bring the world. You know, there's going to be a lot less people on the planet, and, and the newscasters are going to explain this is the end of the world as we knew it. This is a new world with a lot less people. You'll have dumb psychologists and doctors getting on TV and on social media trying to explain, you know, psychoanalysts, uh, you know, this, this explanation of what happened. Now, I'm going to throw in, I'm going to throw in a bonus. I'm just going to tell you my opinion. You can meet me after church and say, Pastor, you are crazy. But I'm just going to tell you my theory. I think that they will blame it on uh, UFOs. 
I believe, I believe that um, all sorts of information is going to come out and they are going to declare that there have been extraterrestrials for years. They've had all this information. They've been hiding it. And I think that everybody is going to, they're going to fall right into this, into this bag of trash and uh, believe it. And, and uh, it's all going to make sense. And he's going to pull the world together. And all of us Christians are going to be gone. And I don't want to be here for that. It's going to be absolute chaos. So, isn't this the most encouraging message you've ever heard in your life? Here's, just don't, don't be here. That's right. <laughs> that's, be that's, ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Just don't, don't wait around for this. It's going to be horrible. I did not want to live through that chaos. All right, let's look at the second question, really what we're going to focus on today, and it's this. What you need to know about the tribulation if you miss the rapture. And can I just say a little twist, okay? I was going to save this for the end. The reason that we did this series in the beginning, all right, we want to make sure you're ready, but can I tell you that we live in a world where the enemy wants to distract you every single day of your stinking life. He wants you to live distracted. He doesn't want you to anticipate the soon coming of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to share hope with your neighbors. He doesn't want you to have enough time to pray over your kids and pour the word of God into your kids and pray as a couple. He wants you to be distracted. And so when we begin to think about teaching this series, we thought, man, this is heavy. But I thought to myself, my goodness, we are doing you a disservice if we don't help you to understand what's really to come and how we better be living with an anticipation. I can tell you that in our own house, man, my teenagers have this anticipation going on inside of them at this point to share Jesus with everybody boldly. I'm talking boldly, walking up to their friends and saying, you had better get your life right or you're going to hell. Like, I'm just going to tell you straight. They're 16. Like, today's their birthday. They don't even care. They're like, I love you and I don't want to see you die and go to hell. We've got to get bold. And I believe that that is why God wanted us to do this series is to help you to get an anticipation and get a boldness that we should have as believers. All right. So let's talk for just a few moments about what this tribulation is. As I said earlier, it's a seven-year period of time where the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the earth. Now listen to me. We talked before about how we believe that the, that the believers are going to be rescued. We're going to, be, we're going to escape the wrath to come. Okay, a fuego. We're going to escape the wrath to come. However, listen to me very, very clearly as we go into this. The wrath of God that is going to be poured out, the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation said, that's going to be poured out is not intended for humanity. Listen to me. It was never intended for humanity. The wrath of God that is going to be poured out during the tribulation was for one reason, and that was to be poured out upon Satan himself. Why? Because God created Satan. He was the angel of light. He was Lucifer. He was literally the worship leader in heaven leading the worship. The Bible talks about this. I don't have time to go into it. But he wanted to exalt himself above God. He wanted to be God. And because of that, God cast him out. The moment God cast him out, the enemy became his, his complete arch enemy. And everything that the enemy has done has been to intimidate and to... Um, imitate is the word I was looking for to imitate God all right so whatever God did Satan tries to replicate and I'm going to show you in Revelation this is unbelievable but everything God did Satan has done to replicate all right why because he wants to deceive people into worshiping him rather than God. That's literally, it all comes down to that right there. The enemy wants to be God. Satan wanted to exalt himself. God said, I won't have it. Now here's where, where God's love is poured out. God created humanity and he said, I want people who will choose to love me, who will choose to have a relationship with me. He's going to give everyone a choice. He's not going to send his son back and tell every single person on the planet has heard the message and has had an opportunity to accept Jesus. Then, even during the tribulation, he is going to raise up the 144,000. He is going to give more opportunity. Though you're going to get your head cut off, you're going to have an opportunity to come to him. But in the end, the choice is ours. The wrath was never intended for humanity. But if we choose to reject God, the Bible says, if you are not for me, you're against me. Oh, I'm not for Satan. I am not a Satan worshiper. No, but by default, if you're not for me, 
you're against me. And we're going we're gonna to share that in the end here in a moment. But let's dive in. Whew. I'm going to take a breather because he's telling me i got 10 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm going to go through some scriptures. I may not even have time to read them all. I want you to snap some pictures, and I want you to take down where these references we're are. We're going to move fast. So you can look it up, all right? Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 18 is a description of the day of the Lord when his wrath is poured out. I'm going to quickly read this to you. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. I want you to understand the description I'm reading here. The cry of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shout his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath. I just talked about that. A day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on that day, on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end to all who live on the earth. As Brad said, this is a very encouraging, encouraging word today. This is a description of what is going to happen in the tribulation, all right? There's three reasons could be more, but these are three important reasons I believe that the tribulation is going to happen. I want to quickly look at this with you. Number one, so that Satan will be released to expose and express his true character. Understand something right now. The Bible says that the enemy, Satan, is the prince of the air. However, he is still under God's authority right now. Do you know the story of Job? If you haven't, you can go look it up. He literally went before the throne of God and he said, hey, consider your servant Job. He had to have God's permission to mess with God's people, all right? He's still under God's authority, but during the tribulation, God is going to release him to be able to show his true character, his true colors, all right? You think Satan is bad now? You just wait if you're here. You just wait until the Antichrist is possessed by him and he rises up. Second reason, so that God can reestablish his plan for Israel. This was his plan all along. We've talked about that. And number three, to reveal his just wrath against sin. And then the end's going to come. All right, go with me. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. It says this, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. I think this is amazing. What is the one thing the enemy wants to do? He wants to deceive you. He wants you right now to be like, my pastors are insane. i got to find a new church that teaches a whole lot lighter teachings, like love one another. We well, should hey, love you, one another. If you find one, <laughs> let me know. I'm looking for one. <laughs> the fact is, the enemy wants to deceive you. Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, I'm just going to tell you right now, the man of lawlessness is the Antichrist until he's revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Listen to this. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. He's going to exalt himself during that time so that he sets himself up in God's temple. Follow me. Proclaiming himself to be God. What did I tell you he did in the beginning in heaven when he got himself kicked out? He tried to exalt himself there. He tried to call himself God. He tried to be higher than God. He's going to do the exact same thing here on earth. Jump down to verse 7. For the secret power of the lawlessness or the Antichrist is already at work. Don't miss that. For the secret power of the lawlessness is already at work. That means the spirit of the Antichrist is here already on the earth to deceive you, to deceive me, to work his lies in and through our lives. But the one who now holds him back, let me back up, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawlessness of the one who is revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth. I had to read this part to you because when I, when I hear about the battle of Armageddon that is at the end of the tribulation, this says that he's going to be overthrown by the breath, 
What was it that spoke life in the beginning? It was God's words. It was his breath. It was his breath that breathed life into us. It says that Jesus' breath is going to destroy him. So he, it's like he's going to let him show his true character. He's going to let him come out on the scene and declare himself as God. Will you just skip ahead? Throw me out the timeline for the tribulation. Massively running out of time. I wanted to show you this. All right. So when we, when we look at the, the um, tribulation, and man, I tried to get one of the most simple, simple things to just show you. During the tribulation, I told you it's the wrath of God. There are 21 judgments that are going to come down during the tribulation, all right? There are the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. There are seven of each. How many know that God's number is what? Seven. So Revelation is a book of sevens, all right? I don't have a ton of time to get into this, but I do want to tell you this, that during the time of the tribulation, there's going to be a point when the Antichrist makes a peace treaty with Israel, all right? I don't have time to read it, but let me just tell you where it's found. So if you are here and you see a peace treaty between Israel and the Arab nations and all the surrounding nations that hate Israel, you will know that you are in the tribulation. You're there. And you will know that the man that affirmed that treaty is the Antichrist, all right? Really important for you to know, for you to be ready if you're still here. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 is where that's found. And it says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. We're talking about that seven-year period. So the Antichrist is going to raise up after that rapture happens. The whole world is in chaos. The Middle East has been having chaos forever, all right, fighting over land and over territory in Israel. The Antichrist will rise to the scene. He will make a peace treaty with Israel, which will literally launch into the tribulation. Most theologians believe that, that that is the, the point where the tribulation actually begins. Then the Bible says there's 42 months. Will you take me back to the first timeline? There's 42 months. Anybody remember a series around here called 42? Okay. There's 42 months. No, nope, you lost me. Okay. There's 42 months of peace that's going to happen. And then the Antichrist will literally establish himself. There we go. In the middle, he will establish himself as God. Brad talked about in the very first week how that Israel has always wanted to rebuild their temple, right? Because from the moment Jesus died and was resurrected, the temple was destroyed. So they no longer could do their acts of worship, the Jewish people, okay? They do not believe Jesus was the Messiah. So the Antichrist, in those first 42 months, he's going to help them to rebuild and reestablish the temple. They're going to reestablish worship as part at of the, the peace temple, treaty. right? As part of the peace treaty. But then... And this is what blows this, my mind. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> I paused. I'm like, you got 10 seconds. Abomination of desolation. He is going to, he will have in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, he will sit on the throne where God is to rest. He literally He will goes proclaim and himself, himself as God and he will demand that all of the earth worship him. And if you do not worship him, you will be put to death. That, but there's not truly three and a half, 42 months of actual peace. We're talking only governmental peace between nations. Yes. The world is going to be experiencing the judgments and the wrath of God. Yes. during. So it's not going to be a peaceful planet. It's right. going to be hell on earth. But there will be peace between Politically. nations coming together. When you see, listen, the, the, the red heifer is already alive. Go back three parts. Part, part one. one. Go back. The temple, the organization in Jerusalem is already making, they already have the plans to build the temple. They already have all of the sacraments, everything lined out. They already have the sacrifice approved by the high priest ready to go. As you watch Russia and Iran, watch them in the news. And the more you see them closing in on Israel, you are going to know that we are right there. Right. All right, go ahead. All right, Weird. I'm going to read you one passage because I just can't close this without doing this. All right. Revelation chapter 13. This is your homework assignment. Okay. You didn't like homework? <laughs> read Revelation chapter 13 this week. I'm going to read you parts of it right now because I really want you to get this because I think people are intimidated by the book of Revelation, all right? I was from forever, okay? It's very overwhelming, and it's like I don't even have time to read all this. Let me go to the Psalms. Nothing wrong with the Psalms. I love them. Psalms are good. Psalms are awesome, but Revelation, you got to get this, all right? Listen to this. The dragon, I'm just going to tell you right up front, the dragon is Satan, Okay? The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and each had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth of a lion. This is what I want you to get right here. The dragon gave the beast, the first beast, there's going to be two, he gave the first beast his 
power and his throne and his great authority. The dragon is Satan. The first beast is the Antichrist. He is empowered by Satan himself. All right, now listen to me. We talk around here about the Trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? Okay, say yes, absolutely. There's Trinity. Listen to this. The dragon gave the first beast, the Antichrist, his power and his great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound. A fatal wound. If you have a fatal wound, what does that mean? You die. Trooper, Hendrix, you die. If you have a fatal wound, you die. Listen, but the fatal wound had been healed. What does that mean? If you are healed from a fatal wound, what happened? You were resurrected. You came back to life, right? Did I not tell you that, that the sound enemy... Like? What does that sound like? Jesus resurrecting from the dead after three days. He's emulating everything that Jesus has done. Everything all the way down to the resurrection. Let me back up again. I'm going to read it to you so you get it. Verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. Now get this. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. How did they follow the beast? When this happens, this is going to happen, and the whole world is going to see it because every news station in the, in the world is going to capture this literally happening. The fatal beast, the Antichrist, takes a fatal wound. He then resurrects, all right? He comes back to life. The whole world is going to stand back and go, oh, wow, he must that's be God. amazing. He must be God. He must be God. He's got these amazing powers. Verse 4, people worshiped the dragon. Who did I tell you the dragon was? Satan, you guys are so good. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Basically, who could come against this guy? He's amazing. The breath of He's God. He's doing these amazing miracles. Verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Okay? We talked about that. Verse 6. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God. You just don't do that. All right? You just don't do that. But he's going to. He opens his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Verse 7. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain for the creation of the world. So what we see here is this. We see that Satan gives the first beast. He gives him power. The Antichrist rises up. He establishes himself as this miracle, wonder-working person, just like Jesus, who literally takes a fatal wound, is resurrected. Everybody in the world now is standing in awe, watching on TV, watching the miracles. They're not reading about it. They're watching it literally happen. And it says everybody then begins to worship him except those whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So those who miss the rapture, but realize I'm in the tribulation. They've now surrendered truly their life to Christ. They do not bow down. Now listen, go on to verse 11. Then I saw a second beast. Say second beast. The second beast is a false prophet. Okay, so we've got the dragon who is Satan. We've got the first beast who is the Antichrist. And we've got the third beast who is the false prophet. We have the unholy trinity. Satan setting himself up, the Godhead, just like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All right. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and all the inhabitants of the earth worship the first beast. So basically, his whole responsibility, just like the Holy Spirit, is to guide in worshiping the first beast, the Antichrist. All right. All right. I'm going to wrap this up with this final part right here. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of all the people. Again, see that word all? We're talking about it being broadcast across the nations. Because of the sign, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, the Antichrist. It deceived, there's that word again, the inhabitants of the earth in order 
them to set up an image. This is what Brad talked about. Get this. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived. We're talking about the Antichrist who died but resurrected. They set up a statue, an image of him in the Holy of Holies. Verse 15. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first so the image could speak and cause, listen to this, all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So if you do not worship the Antichrist, if you do not participate in satanic worship during the tribulation, you will be a martyr for Jesus. Let me jump in, and I'm going to end it. We've got to go. Oh, you got to finish reading 16 and 17. I'm going to. Okay, yeah. do it. The way that he will know, the way that it will be identified that you have consented to worship him will be through what is called the mark of the beast. If I can boil this whole message down to one thing that you need to know, if you're still here, it's what I'm about to say right now. So really pay attention. If you're still here, taking this mark that he will require for the ability to buy and sell, you will not be able to buy food, any fuel, you won't be able to buy anything or sell anything without this mark of the beast. Now, there's different, you know, ideas on what that is. Some believe it's a mark that's on the outside of the skin. Some believe that it's, I believe that it's a microchip that's implanted in the skin that holds the number 666 in it, which is the mark of the beast. I don't have time to go into all that. I did it in part one of this series. Go back and listen. Also go back and listen to, the, I think, the last part of the series 42, and I explain in depth what the mark of the beast is and what it means. But if you're still here, if you receive the mark, whatever that mark is, on your hand or on your head, whether it's a microchip or a mark, if you receive it, you will lose your soul. You are consenting to worship Satan. There is no chance of you going to heaven. There's no chance of the day of, you just had it done. God, please forgive me. I know what I've done is wrong. I'm going to cut it out of my arm. Not going to happen. You can cut it out, maybe, but it's, it's not going to reverse the curse that you've put on yourself for all of eternity. You are, you are confessing that Satan is Lord when you take this mark, whatever it is. So if you're still here, do not participate in the mark of the beast. There will be consequences. Get, hey, I will gladly, if I'm here, and I don't believe I will be, but if I am, I will gladly get my head taken off than to take that mark and to proclaim him as king. Jesus is king, and he alone is king. So if you're here... Do not, take, do not take the mark of the beast. Anything else? I'm just going to wrap it up with this. The bottom line comes down to this. Matthew 12 and 30 says, anyone who isn't with me and opposes me, anyone who isn't, that, let me back up. I'm trying to go too fast. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. I told you a few moments ago that the spirit of the Antichrist is already here working to deceive people. I truly believe that he wants every day of our life to distort and distract. He wants us to get so busy with our life and with our calendars and with everything going on, with making money, paying off debt, being in all the activities that we're in. I mean, our calendars are crammed, packed, right? Technology hasn't made things easier. It's complicated everything in our lives. The enemy wants us to be so distracted that we don't realize that we're not putting God first, that we're not living our life with a boldness and proclaiming because we're so stinking distracted in our own minds. We can't possibly be thinking about sharing the gospel because we're so wrapped up with thinking about what's going on in our own world. Listen, Joshua 24 and 15 said this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We will make sure that we're ready. Parents, it is your responsibility to make sure that for you and your house, fathers, for me and my house, we will put God first. We will be ready. We will talk about it when we get up. We will talk about it when we go to bed. We'll talk about it when we're eating, when we're driving down the road. We will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can I tell you, as, I, as we end right here, Romans 1 and 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Listen to me. Matthew 10.32 says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my 
Father. Church, it is time that we boldly stand up for what is right. We boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's only one God and that we stand for him now. Don't allow yourself to be deceived. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. Don't get so caught up that you watch more freaking politics than you read your Bible. Listen right. to me. Amen. Don't get distracted. Jesus is coming back, and we have to be ready. Right. I'm done. Last week, we were so proud of those 24 that went public with their faith, loudly proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, unashamed of the gospel. Good for you. Good for you. And if you've not been baptized, you let us know, and we will help you to go public with your faith as well. Let's pray today. Father, we are so grateful that you cared enough about us to tell us what the future would look like before it ever happened so we could be ready. But not only that we would be ready ourselves, but we could also help the ones that we love, those we work with, our neighbors, our family, our friends, to help them to be ready as well. God, I pray right now for those watching online, for those in your house today, in your house of prayer, God, that you would put within us a spirit that would rise up, a spirit of boldness to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we would be bold to share hope with those that you put in our path. And I pray in those moments when we would even be telling ourselves, I don't know what to say. I believe in that moment, God, you're going to give us the words in that moment to say what needs to be said to that person, to allow your Holy Spirit to take over and begin to do a work in their heart and in their mind and their life that they would just repent of their sins and call out to you and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. You are Lord. And I make you Lord of my life. God, I pray for this church that there's nothing else that we ever do that we do this, that we would continue to help people know who Jesus is and we would do it boldly without apology. Don't ever let Misty and I as pastors slide into a place of, of, of politics and drama and stupidity as pastors, God, but just to preach the truth of your word without apology, even if the, it leaves one person sitting in this sanctuary. We will do what you tell us to do in obedience, no matter what the consequences. We love you, God. I pray that you put that spirit in all of us with heads bowed, eyes closed. This is the most important part of today's message. Nothing else matters in comparison to this. Do you know him? If the rapture were to happen in 10 minutes, would you be ready? Would you know Jesus? Would you be raptured out of here? Don't, don't get caught being left behind. We don't want you to still be here. If that's you and you're ready to make this life change happen, if you're watching online, if you're in this room, you want to make Jesus Lord of your life. You want to make heaven your home. I want you to pray this prayer with me today. And if that's you, before we pray, if you're in this room, please raise your hand right now. I'm not going to call you forward. I just want to know who you are. If you're in this room, would you raise your hand, please? Jesus, search hearts right now, God. Search hearts of those watching online. If you're watching online, type, I'm all in. All in. Come on, whoever you are. Church, I see your hand. Thank you. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? Thank you, Father. Let's pray this prayer together as a church. Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess Him as Lord of my life. Help me to be ready for your sin coming return. In Jesus' name.